Welcome everyone to Principles of Configuration Management. Since this has been on the screen for a while, you probably know where you are. You're at a configuration session. It's the last session of the conference. The sponsors have packed up and moved out. There's ice cream out there and you're here. So my only conclusion must be that you love configuration as much as me. Yes, configuration. So this is what we're talking about today. And I'm gonna break things up into four different areas, starting with an overview of the configuration system, because I know there are some people in here that this is totally new to them. I know there's one person that I work with that's a designer, so I am gonna do the best that I can, like I do, uh, I teach yoga as well, to make it accessible to everyone, but I promise you at some point you're gonna to start to get confused and that's okay. And if you get sleepy, that's okay with me too. But we're gonna start with an overview and maybe that'll be your part of the presentation where you pay attention and get something from this. I'm also gonna talk about problem areas that folks face and then some recommended approaches to how to use Drupal's configuration system and then talk about one of my other favorite topics, which is configuration validation. So I'm gonna save some of that excitement for the end, but there could be excitement all along the way, we'll see. So, who am I that loves configuration so much? My name's Matthew, I've been involved with the Drupal community for a while. I've helped lead a few uh, initiatives in the Drupal community, including the Configuration Management Initiative that was known as CMI for many years. Uh, I am now one of the track leads. That's a new thing we have in the Drupal community for uh, a star shot and a dashboard initiative. And I also volunteer at another Drupal camp up in Twin Cities, Minnesota, the middle of the country in the Midwest. And I teach yoga and do other stuff and I work at Lullabot and yeah that's about it. I'm on the community working group too. I just love Drupal. Kind of Drupal, 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 powered by Drupal and as a result I go to lots of Drupal events and I'm really glad to be here at this one and thankful for our sponsors for sponsoring this free event. It kind of blows my mind that I get a free conference with a free lunch and free ice cream and I think a lot of that is happening because of these sponsors, so thank you. Now, some people like to take pictures of the slides or whatnot. You can do that if you want. I can smile and pause. You could also go visit and see the slides right now and click along if that is better for your vision or your way of following along or whatever, if I say something. A lot of these things on here are links if you want more information too. So you don't have to frantically write. You can just like soak it all in the first time and go back and click around if you really want or not. So first part, let's talk a little bit with, about an overview, get everyone sort of up to date with some, some of the basics of the configuration system. And I've been giving a similar talk like this for over 10 years. I think the first DrupalCon where I gave a talk about the configuration system to start getting people hyped up was 2013. And people's, people were excited back then, as you probably are now. And you know, we'd have these standing room only sessions talking about configuration because it was this hot new thing. It's not necessarily hot and new anymore, but the principles of what configuration is haven't changed that much in the past 10 plus years that I've been talking about the configuration system. So, generally speaking, configuration is types of things. That's the way I like to boil it down. And then the configuration includes all sorts of different things like views and forms and settings and user roles. Those are all configuration. And then we have the things. So we have types of things configuration, the things being the content, the content being articles, basic pages, taxonomy terms, users, yada, yada, yada. This isn't a, like, a specific, like, real hard differentiation, but it can be a useful way for folks to think about what we're talking about. I also think it's useful sometimes to think about it in terms of 
what people are doing with what. So for me, configuration is a big part of what I do when I'm building the site. My wife, who uh, works in the content side of things, right now she's, for example, doing a big project with the University of Iowa after Lullabot has come in there and built the site. She is helping them take the content and put it into the site, and she doesn't have to deal with configuration at all. So that's another way to think about configuration. And generally speaking, if we start to drill in a little bit more, we, we can say there's two general kinds of configuration. We have simple configuration and we have configuration entities. And with simple configuration, there's just one thing, like your site just has one site name, or your site just has one JPEG quality, which is another exciting topic that we'll get to later, but those are the kinds of things where it's just there's one thing and you're configuring it, whereas a configuration entity can be zero or more, an infinite number of things as long as you don't run out of space. And if you like a visual representation, you might say that in general in Drupal we have this idea of the entities, that's the big gray circle, and then within that content, most content falls within, and it's a, an entity, we have content entities, we also have the configuration entities, and then some configuration that's kind of outside of the entity. But we do have other things in Drupal, there's all sorts of other things like the state system and different places where we store information like say, the last time cron was run on your site, like that's not configuration. Path aliases don't really fit in there either because it's not really an entity, not really configuration. But we take the configuration and then we manage it. So the idea of configuration management could be to different people different kinds of things. These, I think, are some of the key sorts of areas that we would think about with configuration management is consistency in, in documenting what we're doing. Metadata is associated with configuration management. Quality, repeatability. And if I was to sum up what configuration management is, my version of this is to say that it's a process for establishing and maintaining consistency. We want our sites to work. We want people to be able to add all the new hot new features in their development environments. And then we want our production sites to do exactly the same thing. We don't want to have different functioning sites on our pull request environments and our dev and our stage and our production. We want all of that to be consistent and we need to have processes in place to do that. So configuration management can mean all sorts of other things, very complex things to different communities and whatnot. What I'm talking about is rather specific to like how Drupal deals with configuration, but configuration management like as a practice is a, like a really big big thing that I'm not getting into all of it. And then we come to my basic boil down definition for how, what I understand configuration management to do and what I understand Drupal's configuration system to be doing is to be fundamentally providing a way to get your configuration from your development sites to production. And that's really the basis for how we made a lot of choices when we were designing the configuration system. There were all sorts of things. Everybody wanted this, that, and the other thing. We really funneled down as we were working on it, you know, many years ago, down to this idea. And this is something that we're going to see, I'm going to come back to a few times, that we want to have consistency. So let's talk a little bit about something that I bet a lot of you, there's probably a lot of big debates going on in the hallway right now about JPEG quality, right? So right now, if you install a Drupal site, the way configuration works, it has a bit of a life cycle. So it might start with some files, then the files provide some information that moves to the database and files. This is a little bit of a chicken and egg thing. Maybe your site was developed a little bit differently, but there is this life cycle of configuration. 
And, you know, files are what make it all happen, really. So, I mean, who doesn't love files, right? Before, when we didn't have files in Drupal, it was like trying to remember all of the steps that you did on your local environment and write down all 50 or 100 of them or whatever it was and then reproduce that on production. No fun, not consistent. But files, those are consistent. So we have files that exist in different places in the Drupal, uh, Drupal website. Some of them might live in a modules config install directory. And those are just read in the first time. So our JPEG quality lives in a file. You can see the, the whole file path there. But basically, it's saying JPEG quality is going to be 75. Awesome, 75 seems like a good number. So when we go to install Drupal, we come to our install screen, yada, yada, yada. Then we have a site, and in the site, in the database, we have the MySQL database inside, down deep in there. You don't have to understand all of the SQL in here, but to understand that JPEG quality then ends up in your database, it's just, you know, a representation of the files moved over, and then you can see it if you look in the, in the UI. There it is, and it is configurable because it's a form. So there are different people that have different ideas about JPEG quality. Some people think we got to have more JPEG quality. And then others that, you know, they're like, wait a second, we got to save the earth. We got to save the planet and keep that nice and low so we have smaller file sizes. So I'm not going to try and say which size you should be on or not, but Let's just say you did want to reduce the JPEG quality on your site and all of the other political ramifications for doing so and you change it and then we have a system in Drupal that allows you to see the difference between what you have in your active configuration, the database, and what you have staged because the file hasn't changed, you've just changed it in Drupal, it's changed from 50 to 75, if you export your configuration it'll change that 75 to a 50. Again, I don't want to get into all the details. This is the basic overview. So in that sense, then, we have this idea that we have JPEG quality 75 in the database. You change it, export it to files, files, and then when you go to production, it goes back up into the database. It updates it there, thanks to that. But yeah, I know, it's a lot. It's a lot of JPEG quality information to handle on the last session of GovCon. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. All right. So, more some overview. We also have schemas in Drupal that allow us to describe the configuration because who doesn't like to describe configuration? It's exciting. And actually, there's a good reason why we had this, and, and one of the reasons, for example, was when we were building the configuration system, uh, Gabor Hoitzi and, and his team was helping to build like, the translation system, and they said, hey, I want to be able to translate some of the things, like the text that describes the JPEG quality field, and we have to know which things are translatable. So we needed to create schemas that allow us to say, like, hey, this thing, uh, and I switched to a different topic, so you don't have to be overwhelmed with JPEG quality, but maintenance mode, for example, it says the message to display when you're, so this is text, this is something that maybe somebody would want to translate and use the translation system, so those are a few things. But again, everybody then, you know, we, we finished the configuration system 2015, Drupal 8 was released, everybody's happy, all was good. Everybody's pushing stuff from dev to prod. And that's it. I mean, that's all you have to know, dev to prod. I think if somebody could take my picture with this, I would love to have that out on the social medias, dev to prod. I'm not kidding. Somebody take my picture with this slide so I can use it in a future presentation. That is what you need to know, because I still have clients where I am talking about this all the time, and I want to be able to point them to something on the internet where somebody else is like, yeah, Dev to Prod, man, that is what you do. So let's get into the second part of this exciting world of configuration, which is the problem areas, because goodness knows there's problem areas, because people are like, what the heck? Dev to Prod, what does that even really mean to me? I want more. I have a complex enterprise website and it does way more than dev to prod. 
you see I have a custom module that goes from site, you know, I have multi-site, and I want, you know, that my module one to only be on all three, but module two is just on site A and C, but then I want configuration to be shared, and so I have some complex needs because, hey, I, you know, I've got matters of consequence to deal with. I am building a complex enterprise website and maybe like a different visual representation. So for example, you might say like, I only need stage file proxy, which pulls down images from production. You don't need that on production, obviously. So I only need that on site A, but my custom module also, so you know, you get the idea. You have different complex needs and somehow people are doing it and they're thinking maybe it's more than just depth to prod. So let's assume you have some complex needs and yes, it is possible to do these kinds of things. And yet we still have tried. We had something called CMI 2.0, which was this idea like, okay, we have this great huge step forward in Drupal 8 and we've tried all sorts of other things to be able to ham handle these complex workflows. And honestly, this initiative didn't really go anywhere. How many of you have heard about CMI 2.0 recently? <laughs> You've heard of it. We have one who's heard of it and nobody else recently, right? So, but, and yet, we know we have a pretty robust configuration system, if I do say so myself, but uh, just because I love Drupal and configuration. So let me talk to you about some more real life, like some of you are like, okay, come on, enough with the jokes. I want to get to the real nitty gritty of how can I do my complex stuff. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you right now that I'm just going to offer some ideas, but I do think it's good to keep in mind the Agile Manifesto, the first value, which is to prioritize individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So what I'm about to say to you is not telling you you should do it this way, but also this is, if for your team, this might be a good idea if you don't have some good reason not to do that. But, you know, not telling you what to do, good old agile, and ultimately my, my rule, my principle, that's right, that's the title of this talk, my principles, I think, when I actually think about this, I'm thinking about it in terms of being kind to people, not stealing from people, being content with what I have, and other things like that, but that's mine underlying, but let's talk about, it. say you are the only developer working on a site, and you're saying this configuration system is just annoying. I'm, I'm exporting and importing all the time. Like, why am I even doing that? It's such a cool, new, robust thing. Everybody, all the cool kids are using configuration, but you don't even have a dev site. So you're, you're just annoyed by it? Well, guess what? You don't have to use a configuration system. For a lot of my like small sites and blogs and whatnot, like, I don't really need config. The main thing is like if you back up your database, the data is there. You don't have to be going database files, database environment, environment. It is totally fine with me if you don't use the configuration system at all. And if you think about it, there might be like some, some uh, Drupal star shot people, marketers, whoever, where they're not actually necessarily at the beginning moving things around. Maybe somebody just wants to build a site with Drupal. They don't need to use it. So I just want to sort of mention that, and you can still, at any point, export it to files. It's always an option, so you don't have to use it. You can just be content, and instead of doing configuration, hang out with your friends in the field and smile and laugh and stuff. Okay, so let's say you want to enable different modules in different environments. That's a key thing, right? A lot of us want to do that. And you've been reading Drupal Planet, which I highly recommend. Lots of good information on there. And I have been reading that for you know, a long time. And, and there are a lot of people that like config split. And they talk about it. And I still see articles every once in a while. I know some agencies love config split. And people will go and be like, oh yeah, let me look here. Uh, it, it, the canonical example is to have the devel module enabled and I only have a few block placements. So they just want to tweak a few things. Let's use config split. And they're like, yeah, that's what I need. And I see these articles on Drupal Planet. And how many of you have used config split? Okay, good chunk of the room. Um, how many of you have experienced problems with config split? 
Ah, interesting. Just about the same number of hands in a lot of talks. That seems to be a pattern. And the truth is, really, for a reliable config split module to be able to work, it requires infrastructure that simply does not exist yet. And people seem to skip over this first sentence in the module description that says, configuration management works best when importing and exporting a whole site configuration. However, sometimes developers like to opt out of the robustness of configuration management and have a superset of configuration. So, by this is saying right there, first sentence, that you are opting out of the robustness. Now, if you're building a site professionally or for your, you know, your for your job or whatever, like I think you probably want robustness in your configuration. Maybe you don't. Well, where I work at Lullabot, we create these things called architectural decision records. They're public records of things that we think are really important. You can read them. There's like 42 of them or so right now at architecture.lullabot.com. This is our way of doing things, not telling you how to do things. But for us, we're basically saying these are recommendations that we would generally use on every one of the sites, every Drupal site. And one of those is use settings, not splits. Because we think in ADR, we have, there was a great talk by Andrew, uh, first session of this conference. Maybe you started with ADRs and you can end with a little ADRs. Well, some teams like to leverage config split as a general purpose override tool. But the, this uh, presence of config split in the repository often leads to teams using it in production improperly, causing maintenance and develop issues. So I'm saying this as a guy who has companies constantly coming to my company saying, we're having problems with config split. We started using this and we started running into problems and it just got out of hand and then somebody did this thing and we don't know whatever. So if you just want to include and exclude some modules based on the site, there is core functionality that does this. You know, I, maybe you don't keep up with all the changes in core, but we in our ADR say config exclude modules will be used for enabling modules in development and sites. And you just put this little thing in your settings.local or whatever environment you're going to do where you say config exclude modules. And then when you type configuration export and export your configuration, it won't include the stuff from develop stage file proxy. Check. So that kind of thing. That's a key for, I mean, you can look in the default files that come with Drupal and that's right there. So that also, by the way, goes back to good old dev prod, right? I mean, not splitting them. So if we talk about how uh, some cases we have where the configuration in the production environment doesn't manage the local environment, maybe things happen for a different reason. So. This is something I see all the time. And people are like, oh, configuration. I could just change that in the file. I could skip the part where I do it in the database, not use the configuration system, just change the configuration manually, and that'll be fine. But if you do these things in different areas, like if you change a field setting and don't realize you also have to change another one, like the configuration system knows, you could break content and you might not even know it when you're deploying it because you're checking one piece, but the configuration system knows about all the pieces of content. Or maybe you change a permission for a user, but you misspell something and then you've created a whole bunch of security problems on your site that you might not know about for a while. There's a long list of things that can happen. Uh, you know, you could have a cache setting and be like, oh, actually, I know I want this cache setting, and you mistype, and then maybe your site's sitting there improperly caching for long periods of time. It happens. But the solution, pretty simple. Use the configuration system. There's a UI to export things. Most people, most developers probably use Drush. You export it. It does all the thinking for you. And then, ultimately, it's just a way of being kind to the people you're working with. Because if you break the site, 
because you thought, oh, I can just skip this step of using the configuration system and things break, well, then you can run into problems. Or let's say maybe you did use Drush, like, like the presentations say, but the import still doesn't work on production, right? Well, there's one, so there's one thing that a lot of people might not realize is that there are issues, such as with config split, where if you export it and then you import it on another site, there's some scenarios, they're kind of edge cases, but like if you use config split to enable something, the first time you import config, it won't actually import all of the settings. The second time you import, it will bring in the settings that you did. So you need to do it twice, which is kind of weird. And you're like, that's kind of weird. Why would I want to have to do that twice? Well, Lullabot has an ADR describing why we think that's important. We define the steps, and our steps basically look like this, a bunch of Drush commands. And you'll see right in the middle of them, we have config import twice. And yeah, it seems a little weird that we have to do that. It's like, didn't you say this was robust? And well, again, we're covering for a lot of scenarios. Sometimes it's just like your computer runs out of processing power and doesn't import all of the configuration in time, or there's some other reason, and that's why it's good to do it twice. But if you're just setting up a job, you don't actually have to ever type these other than the type, the time when you copy and paste all of these commands into your, your uh, CI, CD process, your continuous integration process, and it'll just do it for you. So it's pretty weird. So somebody, you know, rightfully opened an issue, and if you want to help work on that, uh, config import sometimes needs to be run several times to fully sync. So we know this is an issue, we're working on it, but honestly, it's not like the sexiest thing that to be working on right now, especially with Starshot and all the other fun stuff going on. But we know about this, but for now, import twice. Pretty simple. And then, of course, maybe people make mistakes. It happens. I'm not pointing fingers, that's for sure. I make mistakes all the time. So you can build things into your, it, you can build checks to kind of remind folks that maybe you didn't use the system, maybe you didn't check your work. So we have another architectural decision record where you can read more about this, but you can confirm that your site is always in a default state. So right after you run all your import ca commands, which includes running config import twice, you can run something like this. There's different variations. This is the one I'm using on my uh, current project, where it just actually, you, you've imported everything. You know, well, actually, let me go back. You're on dev. You export. You've got it into files. You go to prod. You import. It does the double import. And then what it does is it adds this extra config status, where it's basically saying, are there any changes between the database and the files? And then it says, if the state is different, then show this, show this message and fail. <laughs> Which means if you've edited by hand and you forgot something, then it, there, there will be something wrong. One configuration can oftentimes affect another configuration, or maybe you edited it by hand and everything was totally fine. But this will check even things like people will go in and just be like, oh, I just want to change the, or add a lang code or something. And they'll be like, oh, and this file was here, so I did it here. But when you do a config export the next time, it'll move it to a different line. And, or maybe people are using different versions of Composer or something. I mean, there's, there's these things that can happen where basically, if you, if you run this additional command, it can just kind of remind folks. So I view that as like not stealing because when I go to start on a new pull request and I'm going to working on, you, you know, you get you, your JIRA ticket and you're like, okay, I'm gonna work on this and I pull down everything from the dev site and all the latest code I'm working on it, and then I do my first config export and then there's like unrelated changes. It's so annoying because then you're like, did I do this? And then, so that person before sort of like stole my time, you know? It was like, now I have to figure this out. Oh, this wasn't me. This was already there. So I have to like delete all my changes or try and remember my changes or like move over the things that I know are changes and then somehow, you know, realize that, oh, the default state is out of, 
out of whack. So you run that one little extra thing and that should help. So these are a few of my key recommendations, like key principles. Export locally using the configuration system. Avoid using splits. And I should actually add too, like I have worked on clients where, uh, for example, I, I, the University of, Ma I think I can say this out loud, University of Massachusetts, you know, we, we used uh, Acquia Site Factory and Acquia Site Factory requires config split if I'm, at least it did when I was working on it. And so there are definitely times when you like sort of have to use it or it, it is functional. But generally speaking, avoid config split. Uh, run the import twice, run some tests in your CI jobs, and actually you're doing pretty good because really the configuration system is pretty good. But still you might be running into problems. You're like, uh, I've done all the things and it's still not valid, so now we get to the fourth big part of this section, the one that you've all been looking forward to, configuration validation. So, Drupal Core is now able to have configuration that is fully validatable, emphasized, fully validatable, and most of you are like, what? <laughs> what does that even mean? Fully validatable. Well, let's talk about some examples. And this is a I'm going to give an overview of this, and I'll tell you, if you want to help out with this, this is awesome, and it can get kind of complex, but this is my best, I've, I've been thinking on this one for a while to explain some of these things in a way be, with, that, that, that will cause the least amount of confusion. So let's say, for example, you have a site, you want to limit the, this is a totally contrived example, but you want to like limit a field, like the site name, I want to say, a site name either can be foo or bar, whatever, right? And so you, have, you, you write a, a validate function and you say if the value of the site name in my form that I just changed isn't foo or bar, then say it's invalid and then you know reject it, not let people save, but if it works, then you write your submit function and you save and you get value. So all of this code, does this. So if I like type capital foo and that's not foo or bar, then it shows this error. And so again, we're using site name because people know what that is. It's a good example for presentations, but you can imagine there's all sorts of error instances where you'd write some special custom validation logic. That's why we have form validation. Now what if we took that logic out of the form and put it in the configuration system. Well, we can do that now with this config validation. So all you have to do, and for a long time, we, we, this is the code from core in the site information form that creates that form. We had this default value config sig fight get name and we'd like grab the latest thing. Well, now we have config target and config target is just saying the target for this is system.site name and then in system.schema.yaml so our schema file you just write constraints and we're going to say we're going to use the choice constraint and it just has to be foo or bar and that will do exactly the same thing as what i showed you before so easier for developers um, the commented out part on the top, the default value, that's actually recently, some of you may be paying attention, that was removed from core and now it does say system.site not name. The part about the constraint foo or bar is not in core yet. Although maybe somebody won't, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's the last session. We had ice cream. Ice cream is good. Gotta keep you, I mean, it's okay if you sleep, but you know, I'm trying to keep it uh, ice, post ice cream hangover uh, good. So there's lots of constraints you can add to your configuration and you can say like the length of it or like it can't, this thing can't be blank or the range and this, this new configuration validation system takes care of it. You can do regex, you can do all sorts of things and the result I think is things like simpler forms. So for example, if you, if you were interacting with your Drupal site through an API, JSON API or GraphQL or something, and, and you have this logic in your form, 
then the API doesn't know about it because the API is not using a form because you're interacting. So if by moving it to the configuration, you're able to validate it and, and do things like, you know, API calls that can be validated and then not have to write it just for a form. So I think this is better user experience. It's certainly configuration validation is helpful to automatic updates. So we are working on getting all of Drupal core into a state where everything is validated. We're not there yet, more on that, but automatic updates, it wants to allow you to be able to just have the updates run automatically and automatically update your site. Like, who doesn't want that, right? Nobody wants to just do all these updates right now. So this is relying on us being able to say, oh, this kind of configuration needs to be a text, this thing needs to be some list of things, this needs to be something else, and configuration validation enables that, which really, if you think about it, wouldn't that be great if this did really start working so that, to the point where your site could just update itself, you know, come on. So, thank you, config validation. Currently, it's only targeting Drupal core and automatic updates, and for this to really work with the contrib space, it means eventually pe more people are going to be talking about config validation because they're going to be asking you to do it in your contrib modules to say what is valid config, and if you're writing modules, that's relevant to you. If you are using Drupal and you want to have your contrib modules update automatically and you want to just use Drupal in a browser and all the other fun stuff we want to do with Starshot, actually as of yesterday, Drupal CMS is the new name that they decided on. Yep, and finally, uh, well not finally, config validation is also like key to recipes. You know, recipes is definitely the new hotness. You've probably heard about recipes a few times already at this conference. But recipes is this thing that for that, I think we're targeting like marketers of a certain site uh, size or budget or something like that. Recipes relies on people being able to import configuration and know that it won't break their site. So imagine if we didn't have config validation and you import stuff and it's like, oh, this thing changed this and this thing changed that and this thing is using the wrong kind of value. Somebody else wrote this recipe and it just breaks the site in the browser. That would be bad, but with, with validation recipes can fail before it ever applies everything and it can help make sure that like I could use multiple recipes and not break stuff because I can validate them and if it still doesn't work I can roll back roll back to a particular point and basically work on allowing people, you know, we're, we're using configuration and configuration validation as a method to allow people to, to piece together a bunch of stuff and be able to say, these things go together. These Lego blocks work together, and if they don't, tell them, nope, before they ever even apply it, this won't work. So, is it going to be perfect? Well, not definitely not to start. We're working on it. Uh, and similar thing, like with... Uh, the API calls that I was talking about. Imagine you wanted to say write a decoupled admin UI for your form, for your Drupal site and you wanted to write it in React and you didn't want you to have your React developers have to know anything about Drupal. So they'd want to be able to like build forms in React and send that form data to Drupal and if you wanted to do that, you'd have to know that that React stuff that they built that was sent to Drupal was good, and that won't work unless you can validate it. So for your admin UI, you need config validation. But the truth is, Drupal, for the most part, is still much more API first than, a, like, say, Drupal 8 was. But in terms of config, you know, we're still working on it. It still have, has a way to go. And 
like there was an initiative before config validation, a JavaScript admin UI initiative. I don't know if any of you remember this one, but it was really, they were quite limited by the fact that we didn't have validation. They couldn't do the kinds of things that I was just explaining, and as a result, um, <laughs> I don't want to say like they didn't succeed because that just makes it sound you know like a failure or something but like like the infrastructure wasn't there for them to succeed so now with a lot of these new initiatives these starshot initiatives underlying a lot of this is config validation which helps with our recipes which is helping all these other initiatives like piece together blocks so uh, you know if you like configuration you think that's pretty cool and maybe if we get configuration validation going and more core covered, we could have a reliable config split and other ways to do all these crazy kinds of things that we want to do now. And believe me, I am doing crazy kinds of things for my clients all the time with and without config split. You can do it oftentimes without config split, but it's gonna be so much more easier with config validation. And this is, a I uh, took a snapshot of this there's a module called Config Inspector that can help you uh, set up your code to make sure to see if it is validated or not. And, and this is actually running against Drupal core like every day when Lear's configured this. And generally speaking, we're at like 40, like the, uh, the, the line that says relative progress is 42%. And this graph goes back to before 2023 and there's a bunch of people working on this, um, but it's a lot of work. It's kind of tedious. I mean, we're going through everything in Drupal, all the configuration, trying to decide what is valid. You know, like what what is a valid site name, or what is a valid URL, or what is a valid email, and how do we, you know, how do we do how do we do that? You know. Sometimes, like with that choice constraint that I showed you, that comes directly from Symfony, actually. Symfony has that validation system. They have a bunch of things that we've been able to pull over. Uh, but there's other things where it's a lot more complex, so we're working at it. We'd love help. There's these two main meta issues. Again, these are links. If you're interested, let me know. I know lots of times people go away from a config talk getting really excited and want to help. So. Those are your links if you want to help. Um, and if you want to learn even more about config validation, Wim Lears is really like, he is, he's excited. I know I seem so bored when it comes to config validation, but he is really excited. And he's been working at this for a long time and really we owe a big thanks to him for a lot of this. Although he's now leading the Experience Builder initiative and there's been a little less action in the config validation issues, but we're still looking for help. So maybe you are inspired by this and want to start using it. We're not enforcing this anywhere, but if you want, you can start validating your own config in your own projects to make sure things are going well. And maybe you, know, you just want to use it to solve all world problems, you know? Everybody's paying attention. That's right. This come to the end. If you want to contact me or heckle me online, those are the places. If you want to look at these slides, you can check them out now. It's the same ones I'm showing you. And I'm happy to answer questions. Yes? Okay, so let's say you have like a custom Toronto um, digital title that, act, that like references like an API in an external system. If you're developing locally, you're like, oh, I use the, I use like the test API. And when in production, I use the production API. And, it's, and I want to store its configuration so I can edit it easily, not, obviously not have to hard code it. You put those types of data in your settings.php files. So in general, not, so you should use configuration. well, it would use configuration. So the configuration is read. You can do configuration overrides in your settings files. So like when I'm working 
with clients that have that exact need, you know, we'll have like a settings.local.php, a settings.dev, settings.staging. And a lot of times, depending on like the security, you know, we'll have to have different, um, we'll have to have uh, different keys and different external um, variables that are plugged in. So, you know, we'll use like um, get env, uh, the PHP library, and then we'll have our settings files read from those. But basically, you can, if you know what environment you're in in your settings file, you can say, if I am in, like Pantheon provides some default variables, Acquia provides some default variables. If I'm in my staging environment, then you can, you can, um, I'm, I'm really tempted to like want to pull up a project or something, but I don't want to get lost. But the main idea is you can do config overrides in settings. And there was a big change from Drupal before Drupal 8 to when we had the configuration system that when it reads those in, it doesn't store them in the database. And actually, just a week or two ago, we finally had this issue that shows, that will show you in the override section which, by default, without needing a custom module in Drupal, it'll show you which ones have been overridden. So it's using the configuration system but it's not, you're not importing and exporting, you're putting it in settings. Where does it show you where the from? On the main configurations, I'm really tempted, but, well, I don't, I don't know that it's gonna work, you know, uh, let's see if I have a, where, where would that be? Um, um, Do I even have a local site? No, oh, I do. Um, under configuration, and then uh, development, and then you have configuration synchronization. Up here at the top, it will show you things that are overridden. So, pardon? Oh, cool. Um, let, let me um, hide that stuff and go to... Um, Let's see, this one is sites, default, um, do, 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 and then you do, oh, do I have some right here? Settings.local, um, there's, yeah, it's kind of, I mean, here's the thing I was just talking about with the conf config exclude, where you ha you're setting settings, that, uh, but that's not what you're talking about. Yeah. So, so something like um, system.logging.error level would be. Let's see. I think in this site, do I have? No, I don't. I haven't exported any config. That's what it looks like to export into sites. Default. Fine. Config. Sync. So, system performance. YAML. So we have in this file system.performance. CSS preprocess. There's that one. CSS preprocess is set to true in the configuration, but in my settings.local file that I have open here, I can change that to another value. And if I change this to is that set to it's set to true there? It's set to false. I wonder if I have the latest version that should be showing me. Like I said, I don't even know if the last time I, uh, oops, the last time I touched this random Drupal 11, oh, I was messing with my site information. <laughs> so it might be broken something in there. This is what I didn't want to get into. Here I am going down a little rabbit hole. Like, uh, let, let, let me try get checkout dot, and then try trash cache rebuild. 
oh, you know what I need to do? I bet I, bet I need to do sites, default, and then in my settings file, I have to do the, the oops. There's a, the local, oh, there it is. If config exists, it is there. I wonder if that app root is incorrect, but anyway, synchronize. Should show that. I have overridden. Interesting. Well, yeah, live demo of something I haven't even looked at, so uh, can't tell you right now, but I'm standing in front of a room full of people, but maybe that helped you do something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Drew probably like Drupal configuration overrides. Don't even have to spell it right. I bet. There you go. Override system. This will show you how that works. And honestly, maybe that issue hasn't even been like part of a core release yet. I think it just happened last week. Um, Boy, this doesn't seem like... Well, anyway. Settings files. That's where you do that. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> the partial? Um, Yeah, I mean, it, it sort of goes against the whole idea of dev to prod to be pulling in these pieces. Could you restate the question? Oh, yeah. So the question is, if I do a, a config import dash dash partial and you just want to pull in one set of config, can you, can you do that or is that a bad idea? And I mean, it's in... It's part of the configuration system to be able to import a single item. You can say, I want to do something, I want to paste it in and pull it in. That's basically the same thing that you're talking about. I mean, it works. Um, if you do an export and everything's fine and your tests don't break, I mean, this is not something I have ever actually used on a site where I really cared and wanted to make sure everything was working because I know in my experience that as much as I try and think through all of those things, the configuration system does a better job of me and analyzing it. Is this done correctly? And I'm gonna, it can do that better when it knows about all the configuration, all of the dependencies. So it does work in a lot of cases. Um, I would say going forward, I would use a recipe rather than doing that and configure, you know, add some sort of custom settings that you want to do there. That, I mean, that's essentially like a partial import of something that you want to do on lots of sites. And I think that's a perfect use for recipes. So I don't want to sort of, you know, dodge the question and say, I mean, recipes are in core, so you can do that now. And I think that would be a better way, a more robust way that has, you know, better checking um, to, to do that. As a novice to recipe, I'm correct to say that if I, if I ran a recipe on Monday, then I change the recipe, I'm free to come back and run it again on Tuesday. Yeah. Yes. I mean, a recipe is something like, it's. I think of it as the same thing as just like typing in the same sequence of commands every time or like, I suppose it's kind of like a, a, a partial import. Um, but yeah, it is, it is like a sequence of events that happened once. Drupal doesn't know where that came from in terms of the source of it. The things happen to the site. It checks to make, it validates the configuration. I mean, recipes just pull in configuration. They're not code. And um, you know, sometimes it does some things and checks those to make sure things don't break. But basically, 
Yeah, config uh, or recipes are a way of pulling in those individual features. So for example, Martin gave a fantastic talk earlier today about creating an event system that used recurring events and calendars and rather than having to configure that, take Martin's work. He's the maintainer of the smart date module, pulled in all of these things in a great way and then that that is like even better to me than a partial import because this is like the community's way of saying, hey, let's share some of these things. And to me, that whole recipes initiative is kind of like the replacement for CMI 2.0. It's our way of saying, we think we can do this well. And that's the kind of thing that I think that will that will it will do well. And I would you I would recommend that over the partial import, personally. Okay, I think we're way over time. Happy to talk about configuration all day. Thank you so much for coming. Last session, great job time.